Welcome to BizTech's Health and Wellness Show. Today we speak to Melvin Wu, Regional CEO of Good Doctor Technology. Good Doctor Technology is a joint venture health tech company between Ping An Healthcare uh, and Technology, as well as Grab and SoftBank. Now established in 2018 with a regional headquarters in Singapore, the company's mission is to provide one doctor for one family across Southeast Asia. Now to tell us more with this tagline in mind, welcome to the show, Melvin. Hey, Brian, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Melvin, for a start, tell us a little bit about Good Doctor Technology, what it does and how it started. Yeah, you know, Good, Good Doctor Technology is a very unique company, right? Um, as you correctly mentioned, we are a joint venture company between very three big giants. Um, one is Ping An um, Good Doctor in China. They are one of the largest telemedicine provider over there. Um, Grab, of course, Grab uh, needs no introduction. They are quite ubiquitous in Southeast Asia. And SoftBank Vision Fund. I think when these three corporates came together, um, they saw a gap um, in healthcare in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, whether or not about accessibility, about affordability, and about reach, right? On how people can access the health care um, within their countries. So they came together um, in 2018 and then they set up this company. But I think what is important is although we are a joint venture of corporates, we run and we function like a startup. So I always think of our organization as a startup, a telehealth startup that is building an eco virtual health ecosystem um, to really help um, users or people um, in Southeast Asia. So, you know, Brian, although we, the, the companies you know, formed us in 2018, but we, only, we really got started um, in 2019. Uh, where we launched um, in Indonesia. Uh, we launched in Indonesia as part of a vertical in the Grab ecosystem, and we, known, we are known as Grab Health. And so with Grab Health in the Grab ecosystem, our primary objective was at that time to reach as many users at the start go, right? So it is, very, it is also very counterintuitive, right? Because you know, we managed to get our services up and running in Indonesia within six months. And I think, you know, in normal startups, you probably would not have that resource or that luxury to do so. And that's because we are able to leverage on a lot of um, different strengths of our shareholders, right? Technology from Ping An side, um, the distribution channels, the ecosystem from Grab, and of course, the, con the connections um, from SoftBank. Right? Although we started operations in Indonesia in 2019, we, as you rightfully mentioned, we, had, we have a HQ in Singapore where we, our product folks are here, our tech folks are here. So it's mainly about developing new technology, thinking through new strategies, new business models, as well as new products. You know, you know Brian, telemedicine is something bordering controversy. Because when we enter into Indonesia, people were not very familiar with telemedicine. Although, you know, they already have um, the incumbent there for about five years, but regulations and the mentality of telemedicine isn't really developed at that time, right? So one of, one of our goal was to try to, as much as possible, educate the public and also try to work together with the governments and keep educating the governments on what telemedicine is, on how telemedicine can help the whole health ecosystem. Especially in a distributed environment like Indonesia, not so much as Singapore, but very much so in an Indonesia where healthcare access, particularly in remote areas to specialist care in particular, is very, very limited or non-existent. Yes, you know, and, and when, when we first started and when I was there visiting um, whether the hospitals, whether or not um, the, the clinics in the rural areas, which is what they call Pukimas, right, which is the central clinic, um, you know, people have to travel from the rural areas for about two hours. Imagine the Chikara traffic, two hours 
into the clinic, queue for another hour and a half because the clinic is always overcrowded. And then when they actually see the doctor, it's like for probably three to five minutes because it's usually for a normal cough, normal flu, right? And then they spend another two hours getting back to, to their urinal areas. So in total, they probably spend more than three quarters of the day just to get a simple treatment. So for us, we think that, hey, there must be a better way of doing this, right? So that's where the platform literally helps, right? It's what we, what we also like to call it's like doctor in a pocket, right? Okay. You whip up your mobile phone, you fire our app, and then within 30 seconds, you, you get um, to consult with our doctors via chat, right? Because, you know, uh, is, we find that chat is the, one of the most efficient way of, of uh, talking to our doctors. And a lot of Southeast Asians are very enamored to their mobile and chatting with their friends. So it's something very habitual for them. Yeah. So when you have, you know, something very habitual, you know, and then when it comes to healthcare, it's easier for us. Uh, it, it's easier for them to also understand how to use, right? You know, but Brian, I think the, you know, as, as I was saying that, you know, what literally helped us scale and grow, you know, for, for better or for worse, it was really the pandemic. You know, and people always ask me, how, how, how did uh, COVID treat you? And I say, actually, you know, COVID is very nice to us. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the correct thing to say, but, you know, COVID is very nice for telemedicine providers and, and players. So, and that's across the board, isn't it? In terms of med, the whole med tech industry exploded during the pandemic because on the consumer side, obviously, they couldn't reach patients. On the business side, they couldn't reach uh, healthcare facilities and it was harder. You had lockdowns. On the business side, corporations and CEOs suddenly realized that healthcare became front and center because they had a distributed workforce. They had mental health issues that were cropping up. There were physical health issues. They needed to make sure that all of this was addressed. And so companies like you came in. And, and just grew. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it, it, it's really a, a, a process and a progress thing, right? I mean, when COVID first struck, people don't know what to do. People don't know how long it will last. You know, people don't know how fast it will spread. So I think the, the first stakeholder to really embrace telemedicine was the government. Because imagine if people from the euro areas like Indonesia or Thailand, where we operate as well, all rush to hospitals or clinics just for simple ailments during this COVID pandemic, the spread of COVID will be exponential. So the governments know that they needed a solution to stop people from going with simple ailments, from going into and overcrowding the health infrastructure, which at that point in time couldn't cope with the excessive number of patients, whether is it COVID or whether it's normal diseases. And then after that, after a year or so, then that's where corporates come in and say, oh, shucks, you know, now people cannot go to work. People are, as you mentioned, distributed. But then how do we engage them? You know, they are suffering from burnout. You know, they are, they are suffering from, you know, really like the, the boundaries are blurred between work, home, you know, play and stuff like that. So, but, so how do we keep the workforce going? And so that is where I think is the next phase of growth for telemedicine, Brian. Because in, in the normal phase, we are focused very much on sick care. Because when you are sick, you power up a doctor in the pocket and then you consult the doctor. But increasingly, as where the corporates, CEOs, and you know, HR practitioners realize that they also need a solution to prop up the wellness and the health of their employees. So that's where lifestyle and wellness comes in. in so that's why, and, and you're spot on because that's a global trend as well. That shift away from an illness paradigm to a wellness a paradigm. So prevention rather than cure. Yes, yes. And, and I, I, I think that is, that is where, where our next phase of growth is as well, right? I think we, we spent two and a half years in Indonesia and another year in Thailand. You know, we launched it a year ago during COVID as well. Um, we focus very much on sick care with our technology and with our parents, you know, Pingang's um, experience. But now increasingly, we are, we are slowly developing more services um, to really look at preventive, not a preventive, but also lifestyle kind of wellness, right? Um, you know, your fitness, your diet, you know, and, and also 
also increasingly, what we are also looking at is also chronic diseases. So it's really these three pillars that I think will underpin a whole kind of a virtual healthcare um, going forward. Okay, but Melvin, let's break down then. These are the things that you're doing, but how are you doing them? What is the technology stack and services underlying all of this? Yes. So I, I think I think really, really is is two folds, right? I think one is our platform that we have really um, inherited and of course customized for different countries um, from China. And that, you know, they have done it for seven years. So it is a fantastic platform. That and mature, us, obviously, because they've done it for seven years. They've they've all you needed to do was literally just localize according to the needs of the market. Yes. Yes. So the, the, the technology is very important. Um, and what, what, is, what is interesting for us is that we, we've emphasized a lot of flexibility of integration. Because to us, um, you know, telemedicine is just a component of a wider health ecosystem. And we don't want to exist in isolation. For us, very importantly, we want to build an ecosystem with different like-minded partners like hospitals, clinics, whether your gyms and things like that, right? So in order to do that, your platform must be as flexible as possible to integrate with other people's technology and platform as well. So that's one of our strengths. The other one of our strengths is, is really about having hired doctors in our, in our company. A lot of, if you, if you, if you look at it, a lot of uh, traditional telemedicine providers um, outsource their consultations to external doctors. One of the things is the, the argument around that is an, it's an asset-like model. Yes. Uh, and it's a distributed model so that the existing doctors can benefit from additional revenue. Yes. But for us, we, we look at it from a different lens, right? We, have, we hired a, a, a core group of doctors within our, our payroll or within our organization. And what they do is they standardize consultations, they standardize quality of consultations, they standardize and they all come together to talk about new ways of treating certain ailments. But you must remember, this is about treating patients or talking to patients online. It's not offline, you know, yes. it's online. There's various different ways of doing it. There's, there's you know, numerous different mannerisms. There's different ways of, of communicating with, with the patients. So having a core internal doctors really gives us the advantage because we can control the quality. We can control the, the type and how they, they do their consultations. I have to interrupt you there because that is a very, very important issue. Because a lot of times, so while the business reasons for being asset light and distributing the doctors are very compelling, for the patients themselves, that's a less compelling value proposition because each time I log in, if I'm talking to another doctor, well, uh, he can pull up my, my, some of my data or so forth, but the reality is the consultation is not as rich in, uh, compared to somebody that I've been dealing with regularly. So your, the whole thing about one doctor for a family resonates with someone like me. Yes, and I, I think this, you know, you know, Brian, I think this is, this is uh, increasingly this is what we are trying to do where the technology is mature enough to be able to assign the same doctor always to a patient, uh, even in a virtual setting. Uh, unfortunately, that is, that is something that we are still working on. Uh, what, what I mean is that, you know, we have in-house doctors, but, you know, a patient can request for the same doctor all the time. But what we see is they don't. They come in, they just, they are, they are more than happy to talk to any of our doctors uh, in-house as well. But, you know, yes, traditionally, it makes business sense to be asset light, but I think we... We, we always think ourselves more than just a technology company. We also think ourselves as a healthcare company. So it's very, it's, it is, I think it's that mentality, uh, right? You know, a technology company, you know, you focus on a lot of the different matrix and things like that, right? But I think we need to bring in the softer side of healthcare uh, where we put patients front and center as well. And you, if somebody come in, they are, sometimes they are sick, they need help. So yeah. how, how, how do you manage that in, without the matrixes at the back of your minds? I think that is very important. So Melvin, then, so this is the reason then why you've also then adopted an online to offline model as well. And you set up the, the, a physical good doctor clinic in Thailand. Tell us about that and what really is the strategy around that? 
Yeah, you know, you know, for for us, traditionally, as 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 you mentioned, right? Any tech companies, we don't like asset. You know, we want to be as asset like as as possible. But I think in 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 telemedicine, where we are trying to build an ecosystem, uh, it 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 helps to to be in that frame of online and offline, because you know, Brian. If, whether in China, whether it's in Indonesia, or whether it's in Thailand, telemedicine can only diagnose and treat 36% of patients coming onto the platform. Only 36%. The rest, we have to refer them to our ecosystem partners, right? Whether it's hospitals, labs, and clinics. Now, in, in Thailand, it, you know, we built, we built a clinic, you know, really for only one purpose, bro. It's really because out of regulation. But building that clinic, also helps us build a brand because now with that clinic you know our clinic is located in central bangkok in one of the more, more populous office cbd area so we are there and you know our our core strategy and business model is b2b you know go out to corporates reach out to corporates and insurances and to help to to encourage them to utilize telemedicine as part of their program so with our clinic there you know it gives corporates not only their branding, but it also gives them an opportunity to come down to our clinic, chat with our doctors, consult with our doctors, because we still do offline consultations at the clinic. It doesn't mean that we don't. Mm -hmm. Doctors are there. They consult and our doctors will also start telling them about telemedicine, right? What, what is telemedicine? How can they help the company and things like that? So having a physical clinic allows us to do that, right? So, but with the clinic, we make best use of what we have. We make best use of the asset. And this is where, you know, I mean, the clinic now, you can go in, you can do certain medical checkups, you can do certain tests. Um, so it, it, it is a, a full-fledged clinic that we have. Um, and it helps us um, further the cause of telemedicine and virtual healthcare. So one of the key challenges, if you look at it, is the fact that adoption was accelerated during COVID. Yes. But then now people have access now to their doctors physically again have you seen a, a drop off in utilization and just give us a sense of some sort of numbers that you've had in terms of growth and and, and consultations yeah so I, I i think during covid we had about about probably 10x of consultations um coming into our platform right whether is it grab health or where is it our, our we had we have another standalone app in indonesia so it's about 10x but what we see, yes, numbers have come down, but it came down to pre-COVID levels, right? But, and the baseline is actually increasing. So what this tells us that those people who come during COVID, they are, some are lead, some, you know, don't come back anymore, but the baseline of patients who are utilizing telemedicine have increased. So the shoreline has increased, right? Okay. Which is what we want to, to get as many people to be used to, to telemedicine. But of course, Brian, you know, but now the strategy is a little bit different. We are, we are now focused on B2B. So customer, you know, corporates and insurances, and even working with the governments now uh, are, are more important for us. Um, you know, the B2C market um, is something that we let it grow organically. Because you, you have a basically expanded and the, the put a primary focus on the B2B market, Give us a sense of what your overall ecosystem looks like in terms of partnerships and alliances. Yeah. So, so when, when we focus on that, right, I think, I think a, few, a few components within the ecosystem is very important to us. And it all boils down to the fact that you know, telemedicine, virtual healthcare and telemedicine is not a, a end all, right? You, it, you still need to have partners. So in, in Indonesia, we build very strong relationships with hospitals, um, with insurance partners, with third party administrators. You know, we were chatting offline just now when you're talking about payment claims and it's still going on, <laughs> you know, in, in Indonesia. But now the third party administrators are, are quite large. They help companies, uh, you know, manage their claims. They help help insurances manage all the you know, their claim loss and things like that. So we work with them. We work with labs as well. But more importantly, because on our platform, a user can also come into our health mall to purchase medication, you know, and things like that. So working with pharmacy partners, merchant partners. So we are a marketplace, right? Of pharmacy partners and you know merchants and things like that so building that relationship with them 
and integrating into our ecosystem is very important. So for example, in Bangkok, right, we, we started, you know, in, in only 12 months ago, but within the whole Bangkok and within Thailand itself, we are one of the, we have one of the largest, in fact, we have the largest pharmacy network in Thailand of about 890 outlets. When our doctors prescribe medicine, right, the system will pinpoint the nearest pharmacy to the, to the patients where they are located. And then we will send a rider, usually, you know, a Grab Express rider to collect the medicine and deliver it to the patients all within an hour. Okay, but that Melvin is in a prescription market. So there are some markets where uh, the doctor is allowed to prescribe medication. How do you cater for that? Oh yes, so so I I, I think I think it's is, it is, it's still the same principle, right? You know, our doctors in Indonesia we do the prescriptions as well uh, via the chat. So we pres you know, because of the pandemic, we were able to prescribe what we call red dot drugs or restricted drugs like your antibiotics and things like that. So the doctors do prescribe, and then but the onus is up to the patients of whether or not they want to purchase it from our partners on the okay. ecosystem. Or they can take they can take that same prescription and then go fulfill it themselves, whether in the, in the nearby pharmacy and things like that. So it, it, the principle is the same, right? Our doctors do prescribe. Now, looking ahead now, uh, Melvin, where do you see some of the growth opportunities for you in the region, and, and especially highlight for us perhaps some key trends uh, in this whole telehealth and uh, uh, med tech space. Yes, and and you know the as I as I mentioned just now, the growth in I believe that the growth in med tech space will no longer be just focused on sick care. It will be based on really a couple of pillars, right? One is wellness, and wellness is is really about preventive, how you prevent somebody from being sick, right? And we work with you know corporates and and insurances on that as well. The other one that I'm actually quite passionate about is chronic diseases. I think, you know, when, uh, you know, for example, in Singapore, right, I mean, you know, the government is placing a lot of emphasis on diabetes. It's the number one silent killer in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So I think in telemedicine, because of our ecosystem and because of, you know, if a patient comes through our system and we are able to have various data that from the patient together with the platform that we are in, in our health services as a solution, um, strategy we are, we are able to advise the patient um, on, a lot, on a lot of things right whether is it treating his chronic diseases or whether is it preventing his chronic diseases diseases from happening and I, I think also you know going forward for any health tech platform there has to be integration for with certain hardware it's already happening now um, you know whether it's your apple watches your samsung your android devices but i think there will be closer integration um, with health tech platforms, uh, physical devices, um, whether or not it is for, you know, the elderly at home, right, where there's, there's smart devices that detects fall or detects or remind them of taking medicine and things like that. So I think putting, putting together the whole ecosystem in the platform is going to be real, real exciting. Melvin, one of the key things then, and you alluded to that without without highlighting it a little bit further, the holy grail for healthcare has always been the ease of sharing of your electronic medical record. <laughs> you know, yes, you know, I totally agree with you. Uh, I think this is the holy grail. Uh, this is this requires a lot of work. Um, but how how you know, this is something that we can't solve alone. Um, it, it has to be various conversations with you know the governments um you know other 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 hospitals other healthcare providers you know in singapore we started it i know um, you know the health information his the health information system but if you see it is only with the public sector the private sector is not plugged in yet uh, but what is interesting to me uh, brian is um, you know uh, just just to 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 simulate some some thinking is that web3 and blockchain represents a very interesting avenue for storage of medical data that will belong to the patient. Now, if you think about it, you know, 
you know, this is probably coming from personal experience, you know, with family members and stuff. When you see a specialist or you see a GP, you don't get to own your data. Right. They own your data. They own your data. And in some countries, they don't have to pass it to you. Yes, they don't have to, right? But even in Singapore, people don't pass. Your GPs don't pass the data to you. I don't know what they write in their computer system when I, when I consult exactly. them, right? So I think, so, you know, you are right. The electric electronic medical you know data passing through various you know facilities infrastructure platforms but the most important thing is how do we think about having the data ownership back to the patient where then at any point in time i want to share or i don't feel like sharing or i want to understand more about what the doctor tells me about it i have easy access to the data Melvin, it's been a fascinating conversation. Before we leave, any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with? Oh, you know, I, you know, I, I just hope your audience will be very open to virtual healthcare and, and telemedicine. I think it's something that is not a pandemic novelty. I think it's going to be here to stay. I think it is something that you will see more growth in and it will, it will sort of permeate more into our daily lives on how we use um, virtual healthcare um, together with all your connected devices. Now, Melvin, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me. Now, I'm Brian Fernandez and we've been speaking to Melvin Wu, Regional CEO of Good Doctor Technology on BizTech's Health and Wellness Show. This video and podcast will be on our website, www.biztech.asia, as well as our social media platforms. It will also be on our TV, our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in.